in the nation, in the world. And sometimes it happens on a pretty regular basis in some of these countries. But God didn't want that. By contrast, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, what's he ride? He rides a donkey. A donkey is not an animal we associate with military power. In fact, a donkey is pretty much a humble creature. You put yourself on a donkey and you're not going to look very majestic. Let's face it, a donkey is not a very impressive animal. You've got those big ears, things going, that stringy tail, and that, that, the hair that just doesn't brush down, and that kind of goofy noise they make when they hee-haw and all that kind of stuff. Not the ride of a general or a king. But the donkey fit the prophecy. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus chose to ride that kind of creature into Jerusalem because his kingdom was not going to be about a force of arms or coercion. It wasn't an army. It wasn't somebody riding forth with shields and, and swords. He didn't come with an army, he came in peace. He bought his, brought his disciples, his followers. He had no intentions whatsoever of establishing an earthly kingdom, and yet that's what they wanted at that time period. In fact, a little bit later when he's in trial, he told Pilate in John 18, My kingdom is not about this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist introduced him um, as the Lamb of God. He said that. And the Holy Spirit, through a dove, appeared above Jesus' head at the baptism, indicating that Jesus wasn't going to be that kind of a king. A dove, even then, was known as a sign of peace through the, the different cultures around that time period. Had, had God wanted him to, to be a warrior, perhaps a sword could have appeared, or something like that. But no, it was a dove. But it fell on deaf ears because they wanted an earthly king. But as, as ministry progressed, Jesus fulfilled prophecies and carried out the ministries of love. But many just saw freebies, handouts, gifts, the man who feeds them, <clears throat> the man who can heal us. Maybe another David. But when it became apparent that Jesus wasn't going to be that kind of a king. The crowds turned on him. They called for his blood and they crucified him. Morning, I have to ask you, how do you see Jesus? What's our image of Jesus? I'm sure you see him as your savior. But so do millions, billions of people claim to be Christians and claim to have Jesus as your savior, their savior. But do you see him as your Lord? The Lord requires us to follow what he says. Do you see him as your king? We're going to follow what the king says. We're going to do what he asks us to do. We worship the king in a way that we wouldn't uh, worship a, a general or uh, uh, you know, a, a mere man. He is the authority of truth in your life, or he should be. Do you just come to Jesus with your hand out? like a lot of people did in that time period, looking for the next free gift. You know, we kind of have developed into a culture of people looking for a handout, looking for a handout from government. There are people who, who make regular trips around churches. When I lived in Carter County, we actually had to set up a deal with the other churches because there were people making a three-county run around there looking for a handout, whatever they could get. I'm sure that there's not many like that here today, but our culture has become that. It should be, what can I do for him, not what can he do for me? Like what John Kennedy said, what can you do for your country, not what can our country do for me? The kingdom of God is the church, and that's what Jesus came to establish. Now the kingdom uh, which Jesus has came to rule and to reign was not an earthly kingdom. In fact, this kingdom is called the Bride of Christ. I can't picture the Bride of Christ coming into battle. All the people dressed in bar bride, uh, bride uh, dresses. If you saw, you know, the, the followers of Jesus are to build bridges to the world of unbelievers. That's one reason I used the bridge analogy. It fit right in with this text, but 
We're to build these bridges. If you saw someone drowning, wouldn't you reach out to them? Wouldn't you so to speak build a bridge to reach out and to save them? Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the domination of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. But shouldn't we build a bridge or reach out to others that they too may be able to do this, that they too may be able to find Christ and make Christ uh, the major part of their life, their king, their Lord? Right now, we are in the kingdom of God. Jesus is our king right now. You are the church. The kingdom of God isn't, never was intended to be a physical kingdom. Earthly kingdoms are always limited by physical boundaries, or they should be anyhow. Sometimes I wonder about our country. Um, back during the Middle Ages, there was a physical kingdom known as the Holy Roman Empire. And the, the, it began when Charlemagne took over the throne in 800 A.D. and ended in 1806, and it covered much of Europe. It, it went all the way from Germany down to the top of Italy, over into the Czech Republic, into the edge of Serbia, up into France. It was, a, it was a large amount of area. It was tended to be a physical kingdom for Christendom, but that's not what God intended. He didn't intend us to, to build this kingdom. It was too isolated and too, too limited. It tried to put borders around the church to protect it. There were heavily guarded and controlled bridges to keep out non-believers, the hordes of non-believers. There were, there were gates and guards. There were castles to keep out non-believers. They don't belong here. Earthly kingdoms require physical boundaries. These borders need to be protected by military right, might, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the church doesn't need a fence around it. The church isn't a physical kingdom. The church doesn't exist on an island, as we need so, no such protection. The church is to be a force on the move, and you can't be on the move if we're isolated off and set apart. Today, many Christians want to keep the church on an island. We're separate from those we see as non-believers. We're excluded and set apart. This serves both on the island and both who aren't on the island. On the island of Christianity, there's a lot of people who like the us and them way of seeing it the world. You know, we're superior. We're on this little island here. And we're superior because we can look over and see what those people are doing. In their way of thinking, many people think of it as avoiding being contaminated by the world. And, you know, we do have to stand independent. We do have to bar ourselves or guard ourselves from being contaminated. But you get that feeling of moral superiority when you're on the island. Like, we're better than those people. You know, I've seen them. When they drink tea, they don't hold their finger out. But, you know, this idea of, of doing this allows the leadership to keep control. And it keeps the sheep from straying. And oftentimes, that's why people want the church on the island. They don't want anybody to hear anything different. There are people who both like it and don't like it. There are many who aren't Christians who want to keep the church on the island. And that number is growing. They often look at Christians as judgmental, self-righteous, self-serving, hypocrites. It keeps Christians, if they're on the island, it keeps them from meddling in schools and politics and their lives. You stay out of my life, you know. In fact, there are many who get angry when we come off the island as they don't want us to interfere in what they have to say in the government, the society, or church. The church shouldn't be any part of our society. It needs to be on the island. They don't want the church to interfere. They don't even want us to suggest we come off and start saying that there's something as sin. You know, that doesn't work either. You need to take that back to the island. There's a bridge, there's a, an island called Prince Edward Island off the coast of Nova Scotia. A uh, little island independent. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. It's part of the providences there. But one thing about that, uh, that island is pretty, pretty set off. And the one claim to fame is about a person who never really lived there. And that's Anna Green Gables. And people know the story of Anna Green Gables. Great stories, you know, and they've added to it. Well, I had an acquaintance from college that lived there, and he says <clears throat> people come out and they want to see the house, they want to see the school, they want to see where she lives, so they had to create all this stuff for the tourists. 
And some of the people there liked the tourists. They made money. Some of the people wanted nothing to do with it. Well, the Canadian government said, we need to build a bridge over to Prince Edward Island. Oh, my goodness. The people on the island went crazy. We don't want no bridge. And the Canadian government says, hey, we're going to build a bridge out there, eh? We're going to make you all part of us, eh? We come together. And the people said, no, we don't want the bridge. Well, the bridge was built, eventually built. They love it. It works. I'm sure there's still people on the island that don't want those people from, you know, way over there in Nova Scotia bothering them. Jesus taught his disciples this kingdom was going to be different. We're called to be salt and light. We need to be able to reach out to the lost. We can't do that if we're on an island. Bridges are made to connect, to join, to tie us together. You don't build bridges to separate. You build them to tie together. Jesus taught his disciples that his kingdom was going to be different from earthly ones in this significant aspect. He knew there was going to be division, division that man has caused because they don't want the Christians to interfere and there are Christians who want to keep that division up and, and break it up and put themselves in their own little groups and islands. In Luke 12, 51, he says, Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but, but division. But this division is because there are those who don't want the church interfering in their life and there is on the church who want to keep it that way. There are too many Christians that like it that way. The disciples were told by Jesus in what is known as the Great Commission in Matthew 28. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. If we're on the island, how are we going to bring it to the people on the outside? If we're secluded and set away and we're not bridging out to these people, how are we going to baptize and make disciples? How do we follow the great commandment or the great commission to the person next door or somebody who works with us or that family member that, that isn't a Christian if we don't bridge out to them? Isn't it time we build bridges and come off the island? What we need is to bridge the divide the bridge has to be built by Christians. Those on the island aren't going to build any bridges. Those are not on the island. Um, at the same time, we have to keep our identity. That's what makes us different and not get caught up in the culture of the world. We can be in the world but not part of the world. You know, there was a, a bridge that was going to be built between um, Cincinnati and Covington. And the, when this was set up, the, the two towns actually set their streets up so they would match. They were collinear with one another. And there were some in, that hoped the bridge would be built in the future, but there were some in Cincinnati that didn't want it because they thought that the, these cities in northern Kentucky were going to take away from the, the gym city. Isn't that what they call it? Uh, I won't go there. Anyhow... So what they did is they fought it, and when they had the bridge actually built, they made sure it didn't line up with any streets in Cincinnati. They, they fought against it. They feared building that bridge, and yet it was a fantastic thing that developed that during the middle of the, of the 19th century. Had it not been built, those two cities would never have grown. Uh, it deprived Cincinnati of this grand uh, avenue coming off the bridge. Fear tried to stop that bridge. You know... If the Wildcats just practiced and practiced, no matter how good they were, if they didn't take out their game and play other teams, it would be just so much trash talk. Yeah, well, we're better than you are. You know, we're really good right here in our own, you know, in our own gym, right here in Rupp Arena when no one's around. We're great. Well, it doesn't work that way. You can't fear what the other teams have. You can't live in fear or your, your playing is just practice. Coach Cow encourages his players to acknowledge the assist of their teammates, to build them up. Instead of a couple of hot dogs out there like you see in some teams, you know, the guy who you know is going to the NBA and he walks over everybody else, Cow doesn't lie on that. Um, it's teamwork that got them where they are. It's the kind of teamwork that Christ wants us to have and to build his church, where we work together and build bridges and reach out to other people. Jesus 
wanted to establish a kingdom where all citizens work at building each other up and building bridges to the lost. Each and every one of us as ministers. When the Great Commission says, go and make disciples, it says, go you. You's left out of there, but go and make disciples, and you is all of us. We can't let fear keep us in hiding. Jesus didn't save us to be on the defensive and to hide on the island. Jesus saved us so we could be on the offensive and take on Satan and take Satan down. We're not out to, to take prisoners of people who aren't Christians. Our enemy is Satan, who's taken over these people. Our object is to take Satan on, to take battle to him, not stay hidden away. For Jesus to create a physical kingdom with earthly bounties would have limited his church. But Jesus declared, the kingdom of God is within you, within me, within everyone here who's given their life to Christ. You take this kingdom wherever you go, but you have to take the church on the road. You are the kingdom, the church, and we need to build bridges to those who aren't. The church has citizens, practically every nation of the world, so the church's power is only limited by the imagination or lack thereof of its members. And most places have a harder time than we do of getting the word of God out. The kingdom of the God is not about force and coercion. It's about the truth of God. It's about setting a good example. It's about taking a stand, reaching out to your brothers but not giving up your faith. It's about prayer. It's about reaching out. It's about love. It's about building a bridge across the divide. I believe this nation came into being to carry the gospel to the world. Do you believe that? Here we have the freedoms, and only here do we have the freedoms, the resources, the ability, the education, the people to carry the word of God to the world. And we're not doing a real good job of it. But we are losing it right here at home. We're losing our homeland to Satan and to the influences of Satan. We cave and hide from the truth. We have to speak out. We can't retreat. We need to reach out to the world one person at a time and be willing to take a stand in issues that affect the church. Jesus hadn't come to exercise authority to build a new Israel, isolated and set apart. It would still be like that today. Jesus came to bring salvation to Jew and Gentile alike. He came to seek and save those who were lost. No matter what color they are, what nation they're living in, they're not the problem. Satan's the problem. This is the problem in this country. So many non-believers, and they have the marketplace, and they're the ones that we listen to. They're the most vocal, and we sit back and say nothing in so many, time, so many cases. We stay on our island. We need to carry on his work here one soul at a time. We need to work together. It means we need to get involved. It means you need to get into a ministry. It means you may need to start a new ministry. There are people out here that have all kinds of skills and talents and groups. There are nurses. There are teachers. There are people who have skills that no one else has. You know people that other people don't know that you can reach out to. There are people that only you can reach and only you can bring the word of God to. We need revival right now. Isn't it time we build bridges? When I think of bridge builders, I think of certain people. I think of C.Y. Kim. C.Y. Kim is an American missionary that's uh, imprisoned for his faith. He spoke out against the Moonies in North Korea and was put in prison. He's ministered in China, Russia, and even in, down into North Korea. Smuggled Bibles into Vietnam, and they just started a new ministry, his cram ministry, uh, Christ Reasoning Asia has started this, now they're, they're into the Philippines. He's built orphanage and he's built schools for the, the, the rejects in, in uh, China. They don't, want, they don't want disabled children. They don't want physically or mentally disabled. They don't want the older people. They serve no youth. They throw them out and discard them. He's built places for them. He's built schools for them. He baptizes up there. He feeds thousands through the money that we've given, he sends thousands of meals a day in North Korea, feeding children. 
5,000 a day are given a soy loaf, and now they're given some milk, and now they provide blankets for them, and they provide gloves for these people that their own leader hates, but God loves. I think of Asid Autumn. He's a minister in prison in Iran for sharing the gospel of his Christian faith. He's a bridge builder. I think of Richard Wilder. Richard was embarrassed about this this morning. Started a mission in the uh, ministry in the prison that's gone further than I think he ever believed it would go. You need to talk to him about how this is going on and what's happening and how it's developed. He's meeting with, with the governor. He meets with, uh, you know, he's invited to the governor's prayer breakfast. They're starting a school in, in, in the prison for people, for Christians. A Christian pres- uh, school. The, I'm getting excited you can tell that. The only one in the nation like this. And our church is involved thanks to Richard Wilder. You need to thank him. You need to help him. He's not here, but I wish he was. I think of John Sims, who, who is in charge of our mission program and all the help, all those who are helping him. John is always seeking new ways to reach out and to bridge the void. He's always, his mind's going 24 hours a day. He can't sleep for thinking of how he can reach out to people in this community with the word of God. What a bridge builder. I think of my dad, Ralph Humes, 54 years of Gideon. He's given out thousands and thousands of Bibles. He was told by school principals, don't step on this school property. You're not allowed. He was, he was cursed at and, and spit at by students at WVU, West, West Virginia University, when he went over there to hand out uh, New Testaments. I think of Aaron Gabbert, our own Gideon, doing the same thing, maybe not on the scale, he's nowhere near as old, but doing the same thing of reaching out and bridging. I think of all of you who have found new ways to, to build a bridge to reach out to the lost and dying, the helping hands, dolls of hope, and others that I'm not even aware of. We can build these bridges. You can do it. You can start a ministry that no one else has, has, has started. <clears throat> so you don't think you're a bridge builder. That's not me. Neither did Emily um, Roebling. She was a wife of Washington Roebling, the daughter-in-law of... <clears throat> I ought to let you just read it. The daughter-in-law of John August Roebling, the designer of the Cincinnati and Brooklyn Bridges. John Roebling died from an injury soon after starting the Brooklyn Bridge. He had tetanus. Soon after that, his son Washington took over. He too became too ill from actually working on the piers. And if you want to know more about that, it's a fascinating story I'll tell you later. Anyhow, he developed bends. He couldn't leave the house, so he would sit up in his room and look out over the bridge. His wife, Emily, an educated person, but not an engineer, carried his instructions to the bridge. But in the process, she learned engineering. She learned about cable design, why the cables weren't strong enough. She negotiated with the the bridge builders and and, uh, the workers. She represented him to the politicians, and she defended him to critics. Emily Roebling became a bridge builder. If you'd have asked her when she was 18, I'm sure she would have said, no, not me. You can do it too. Every one of you can become a bridge builder. God's church isn't about me. It's not about you. It's about reaching out. It's about Jesus Christ and all the people around us he came to save. The people who live in other places that we can reach out to through our missions programs. We can do it. We can build bridges. If we do it right, we give Jesus and the kingdom the kind of attention they deserve. People will want to see the Jesus we say we belong to. You can do it. Everyone here has power that somebody else doesn't in one way or another. And I have faith. That brings us to our time of invitation. Time of invitation is a time when, if you've never given yourself to, your, your life to Christ, that this is an opportunity to do that, to come forward to repent of your sins, and to be baptized, to be immersed as the Bible tells us. It's a time when maybe you want to move your membership to the church. We had a young lady this morning did that. Praise the Lord. Another person here at at the church. If you want to come forward and have somebody pray with you, that's 
that's, uh, that's open. If you want to build a ministry, if you have a, an idea, contact one of the elders or Greg or one of the deacons and do that. But I know coming up here violates your comfort zone. I can remember standing back there with my knuckles on the, on the front of the pew turning white as I held on so tight as the Holy Spirit tried to pull me away. And the sin inside me and, and the devil inside me held me to my seat. But you can let go and you can come forward and give your life to Christ. Think of all those who have gone on before, building bridges, opening door, and stepping out of their comfort zone. Thank come you, forward. Harry. Let's all stand together for a time of invitation. Today, uh, our prayer room Nobody's will be in left. the back, to my left, your right. If you have prayer needs, slip in there as we sing today. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior. Please be seated for just one moment. I'm going to ask if Jacob and Samantha would come on up. I don't know why I'm putting that back on there. This is Jacob and Samantha Semino. I'm saying that right, right? Yes. Okay, good. I'm proud of myself. Uh, but they come today as baptized believers in Christ, wanting to place their membership here with this church family. Why don't you let them know what we think about that choice and decision? And normally... I say take my hand, but y'all got your hands full, so we'll, we'll just uh, skip that part today. But if you would, just repeat this confession of faith uh, with me today. I believe, I believe that, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of God, God, and my Savior. And my Savior. You believe it too? All right. <laughs> and we just welcome you to the family. And if you need to go, feel free, but if, if you care to hang out at, for in the lobby. I know a lot of folks are going to want to welcome you and uh, get to know you today on the way out as well. Um, I want to do something today that I've been aiming to do for the last two weeks, and I tell you all the time I have ADD. I'm not kidding about that, okay? But for the last two weeks, I have been meaning to congratulate our boys and girls basketball teams on seasons that were well done. Uh, the boys... Boys won the district and went to the regional semifinals. Our girls won the, won the region and went to the state uh, tournament this year. So let, one more hand for all of them uh, today as well. Um, if there's anything else, Jacob, you got anything? 
tonight, regular activities. Don't forget, tonight's a little bit different on our normal routine. We're at 6.30 instead of 7 uh, this evening. Is that something I need to? Okay, we don't know. It's just doing it. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, let's stand together for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for uh, the freedom and the ability to be here in your house. God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as Harry has shared with us today, we, we pray that you'll help us to be people that, that don't just live out on an island to ourselves. And Lord, sometimes it's tempting to want to do that. As this world grows darker, we just love to, to be here with people of like mind and just stay where it's safe. But God, you've called us to go out into the world and to build bridges to the lost. So I pray, Lord, that as we leave this place today, that we are a source of light everywhere we go, that we take your, your light, your truth with us, that we live in such a way that, that people see you in us, that they ask questions, that we speak up when we get a chance to share the reason that we have the joy and the hope that we have and how we know that we have eternal life. Lord, we love you. I pray that you'll bless each of these that I love and care about, Lord, my brothers and sisters. Keep them safe. Bless them and protect them through this week. Bring us back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name we pray, amen.